So as we begin our analysis, what we're going to be looking for are small signal capacitors that we're going to label as C sub i and resistors that are associated with those capacitors that we're going to label as R sub i. And what our R sub i's are defined as are driving resistances seen across the capacitors. In other words, we're going to have some RC time constants based on the total resistance that each capacitor sees. To begin the analysis, what we're going to do is assume that all small, small capacitors except the one that we're interested in analyzing are going to be open circuited. We're actually going to open circuit the one that we're analyzing, it's just that we need to be aware that the one that we're analyzing we're going to treat slightly differently. In other words, we're going to try and figure out how much resistance is across the one we're analyzing. All independent sources are eliminated. And of course what this means is our voltage sources are short circuited. And our current sources are open circuited. And any large capacitor in our analysis, in other words, capacitors that we might label as infinite or as bypass capacitors, so any large capacitors, are going to be short circuited. All right, we're going to make what we call a dominant pole approximation. And what this means is essentially we're going to be looking uh, to say that one pole has a much lower frequency than any other pole in the circuit. So that would mean that we might have an omega P1 that has a much lower frequency than omega P2 all the way up to some nth order pole, omega P n. And with this pole, we're going to say that we have a one pole response, FH of S is approximately equal to 1 divided by 1 plus S divided by omega H. where omega h is equal to omega p1, which is equal to 1 divided by the sum of our time constants, sum from i to n of c sub i's times r sub i's. So we're going to basically combine all of the poles in the circuit into one pole and assume that that one pole is a dominant pole. So with this, let's do an example. So let's assume that we have a circuit that looks like the following. We have a voltage source that has a series resistance R sub S tied to a gate resistance that's driving the gate of a MOS transistor. The drain of the MOS transistor is tied through uh, from the supply to the, uh, through a resistance, R sub D. We're taking the output on our drain and we're putting the input in on the gate and we will ground 
the gate of that MOSFET device. So this is a common emitter amplifier. Here we're going uh, to draw the capacitors associated with the common emitter amplifier, the small signal capacitors. These will cause the open frequency time constant. So open circuit time constant, pardon me. So we have a CGS. We have a CGD, C gate to drain. And at each of the drain and the source, we have what we would call a drain to bulk, CDB capacitance and a source to bulk CSB capacitance. So remember in our analysis all capacitor all small capacitors are going to be open circuited. And we're going to try and find the resistance that each of them sees individually. So that we can find a time constant or a tau for each capacitor. So for instance, let's start with CGS. In order to find the tau associated with CGS, we need to find the total resistance that CGS sees. So we're going to open circuit all the capacitors and we're going to replace CGS with a voltage source. And of course, all of our signal sources will be appropriately terminated. Voltage sources shorted, current sources open circuited. So we're looking at CGS, so we're going to put a test voltage source where CGS sits between the gate node and ground and we're going to assign a test voltage of Vx and we're going to measure the current that flows out of Vx. So ultimately RCGS will equal Vx divided by Ix. Now we can see clearly that this I is not going to flow into the gate of the transistor but will instead flow through RG and RS which are connected in parallel so VX over IX is simply equal to RG and parallel with RS. And hence our time constant T or tau CGS is equal to CGS times RG and parallel with RS. Next, we need to find the time constant associated with the capacitor CGD. Same procedure, we eliminate all capacitors and independent voltage sources. And we have a very similar looking circuit. Except now we have a voltage source in place of capacitor CGD. And we're going to measure, we're going to put a test voltage Vx at that voltage source, and we're going to measure the current that flows through the voltage source. And if we were to do so, we would find that RCGD is equal to RD in parallel with R out of the transistor plus GM times RS in parallel with RG times RD in parallel with RG. And we could find a tau CGD that was equal to CGD times that total resistance that we just calculated. Now we're going to look at a way to simplify this uh, capacitance calculation in the next part of the lecture, but for now you can just ex uh, try and prove that RCGD is equal to this statement. We only have one other capacitor that we need to look at. Even though we drew a source to bulk capacitance, you can see that it's shorted on both sides. So the only other capacitor that we need to look at is 
the drain to bulk capacitance. So we'll draw the circuit for analysis here. test voltage source where the drain to bulk capacitance is, which is between the drain and ground. Our bulk is grounded, remember. We're going to give it a value of Vx and assume a current Ix flows through it. And we're going to calculate RCdB is equal to Vx over Ix. And we can see clearly that that current is going to flow into the resistors RD and RO, which are in parallel, so we can say that the total resistance is just simply RD in parallel with RO in this case, and our tau CDB is equal to CDB times RD in parallel with RO. Now remember we said that we have a dominant pole approximation, so what we're going to do is assume that our pole frequency, omega H, is equal to 1 divided by tau CGS plus tau CDG plus tau CDB. And if we were to draw the frequency response, just the magnitude response in this case, we would see the magnitude of the gain with respect to frequency would have some value a naught starting at DC and it would reach a pole frequency omega H and then start to roll off at approximately minus 20 dB per decade. Now one problem we note is that if we were when we were looking at this capacitance that went between the drain and the gate we had quite a bit of a problem so in the next part of the lesson we will learn how to deal with that in a, a, a much uh, simpler solution using what we call the Miller's theorem.